Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman. Welcome back to another episode of The Oregon Bridge. The intergovernmental coordination has to happen in day one after the election. Those 12 people have got to put their heads together, meet each other and figure out what their principles of partnership are going to be and how they're going to work together. But they've got to come up immediately with some kind of strategic plan that represents where they want to go, what their values are and how we're going to get there. All right, folks, Uh, this week, I am very excited to bring you a conversation with Olivia Clark. Uh, Olivia is a candidate for Portland City Council District 4. Uh, And as you'll hear in this episode, I think she brings probably the longest and most impressive resume, um, or at least among the longest and most impressive resumes of any candidate for City Council. So here's an overview. Um, She founded a nonprofit, which many of you are probably familiar with, called CASA, which focuses on building farm worker housing. She was the legislative director for three different mayors in Salem. She then went to work as legislative director for uh, a state agency, the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. She worked in the Kitzhaber administration for basically his first two full terms, first as director of intergovernmental affairs, um, which we talk about some of the interesting work that she did there, and then later as legislative director to the governor. And then she spent um, 11 or 12 years at TriMet, uh, obviously a regional government in the Portland metro area focused on transportation. Um, so she's done all these things and never run for office before. So in this episode, I ask her why. Why now? Why her? Um, we talk a little bit about her childhood, her story growing up, I found really fascinating and and moving, um, working at her father's diner, um, which she talks about. And then we talk about her time in Governor Kitzhaber's office. We talk about her time at TriMet. And then we shift to Portland and what's happening today. I ask her what her thesis is for what went wrong uh, in Portland and how we arrived at this moment. We talked about the perception that government isn't working or can't meet the challenges of the day, whether that's true and what to do about it. Um, And we talked about what her approach would be um, if she were to be elected, like starting on day one, how do you work with 11 people, 11 other people and a mayor of diverse viewpoints? So uh, fascinating conversation. I really enjoyed um, talking to Olivia, and I think you will too. Um, You'll notice that the three city of Portland candidates slash potential candidates we've talked to so far are all in District 4. Um, check out the episode with Eric Zimmerman, Tony Morris, and then uh, this week we have Olivia Clark. We are in conversation with folks from all of the other districts um, about potentially scheduling some of those. We're trying to do some level of balance with not too many City of Portland um, candidate episodes, but also there's a ton of them, and so we want to try to bring as many voices as possible. We're working through it, Uh, but stay tuned. You'll hear from other folks. Another plug, if you are interested in coming on the podcast, uh, let us know. Uh, we would be happy to try to make it work as best as we can. Um, and yeah, we welcome your feedback. If there's people you think we should talk to um, that we haven't yet, uh, please let us know. But without further ado, please enjoy this week's episode with Olivia Clark. Now that the legislative session is over, it's time for Oregon's activists, candidates, and political committees to turn their attention to the 2024 elections. With government regulation of political activities becoming more complicated nearly every year, and with political actors increasingly initiating complaints and litigation to achieve political goals, having experienced legal counsel has become critical to success in the political arena. Harang Long PC has represented clients involved in candidate and ballot measure elections for decades. To learn more about Harang Long's political law practice, check out our website at harangue.com. That's www.harrang.com. All right, Olivia Clark, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks. Thank you, Ben. So Great Olivia, I, w- I was reading through your resume and I think you have one of the most impressive and, and longest resumes of a council candidate this time. I'll go through briefly um, some of the high points from your previous career. Uh, you founded a nonprofit that some people are probably familiar with called CASA that focuses on building farm worker housing. You served as the legislative director for three separate mayors in Salem for the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. And I guess you were ledge director and um, sort of like the local government liaison, intergovernmental affairs for Governor Kitzhaber. You then went to work at TriMet. 
So you've done all these things in government and uh -huh. never before have you run for office. So right. my question to you is, why you? Why now? Um, given the career you've had, there's probably many other things you could be doing. Uh, <laughs> why decide to make this run at this moment? Good question. And my friends ask the same question. In fact, some of my friends are like, uh, I don't know whether to congratulate you or send for an intervention. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, are you crazy or? <laughs> exactly, exactly. I could be doing other things. Well, I guess, Ben, I, uh, I feel like I really want to use my experience mm -hmm. in government, um, my record of success, accomplishments uh, on this cusp of incredible change mm -hmm. at the city of Portland, changing the form of government. I feel like I have the skills to make that work, to work with uh, 11 other people and then the mayor, mm -hmm. to work with other levels of government. Uh, one of the things that my uh, career shows is that I work in partnership, I build coalitions. So I feel like that's the perfect time for me to use those skills right now, even though I think it's a very, very challenging environment. And I feel like a lot of people in Portland a great sense of urgency. Yeah. I just, if I had a slogan, which I don't, but I think it would fix it. Let's just fix it. Hmm. Um, and I, um, that's what I want to do. I want to sink my teeth in and fix it. So I want to ask about your, your background, but before I do, I wasn't planning to, uh, there's like some topics that everybody running for Portland, you all are going to have to answer a million times, you know, housing and homelessness mm -hmm. and probably form of government too. But I'm, I guess I'm particularly interested in your perception on the form of government question. It was this very, um, I don't want to say controversial, but there's a ton of opinions when uh, this committee was formed to rewrite Portland's form of government. They landed mm -hmm. on a form of government that basically exists nowhere, um, the precise way that we've designed it here. How mm -hmm. are you feeling about where where the city of Portland landed and what this new form of government will be? Did did we get it right, or are there things that you're already imagining <laughs> to improve? Well, I don't know that we got it right, but I know that we had to do something, mm -hmm. and I think that's how a lot of people felt: is we have to do something. This is right. not working, and for a long time, you know, Portland's been an outlier in its form of commission government, right. where the commissioners are running the bureaus which really doesn't make any sense. And as somebody who I guess is kind of a government nerd or local government nerd, having a city manager to me is critical. And to group the agencies, uh, and that's exactly what Michael Jordan is working on right now mm -hmm. as a result of the ballot measure. And I think that's terrific. That was the number one thing that we needed is to change the form of government. 12 people, I don't know, that's a mm -hmm. lot. Yeah. Uh, you know, three from each district, you know, Yahoo, uh, it's going to be Mr. Toad's wild ride, I think, initially. <laughs> um, but that's that's where we landed. Yeah. Um, and and then ranked choice voting. I think there's uh, good things about that. I think it's just more complicated because of the way we've set up the 12 member council. That's right. And everybody's going to be struggling with how to understand that and and translate that to the voters. Mm -hmm. Um but it's a grand experiment. I just think, again, Oregon's going to be on the cutting edge of Portland. You know, Oregon has a tradition of coming up with great ideas. We don't always implement them, but other places do. <laughs> so this is just another one of those um, interesting experiments. We'll see how it works. I like that. We will see how it works. And I imagine there will be. Well, I, I just read actually this week, I think previously Commissioner Gonzalez and Commissioner Ryan had um express an interest in putting a mayoral veto on the right. ballot for voters to mm -hmm. consider. And I think they just decided they're not going to do that in time for this election. Right. And so that's one dynamic that I'm very interested in is like, what should the proper balance be between council and mayor? Um, I think council selects the city manager or no mayor selects city the manager, mayor, but yeah. council has to approve it. Mayor presents a budget, but council has to approve it. Mayor doesn't get to a vote on anything except for if a, there's a tie is that tie, right? a tie breaker, um, I believe. but mm -hmm. but can't veto anything um so yeah it's just a, it's like again there's no like right answer but we will see how the dynamic <laughs> right right and... no, the mayor is outnumbered <laughs> yes <laughs> yes pretty severely yeah. yeah maybe the mayor will at least get a larger office or something like that <laughs> yeah no it's an experiment 
Yeah. So, um, okay, let's let's back up a little bit. Um, your your background as a kid and going into college um, seems like it might have played an impact on how your life unfolded. Your your website talks about working at your dad's diner as a kid and being the first in your family to go to college. Can you just tell us what it was like growing up for you? Uh, well, it was a lot of hard work. Yeah, I bet working <laughs> the whole, in the diner. <laughs> the whole family worked in the diner. And if you know that kind of business, you know that you don't take vacations. Mm. And even after church on Sunday, you're going down there to mop the floors and wash the pots and pans, which my brother absolutely hated. Um, but then my, you know, my father would reward us with either 50 cents or uh, horseback riding. We usually chose horseback riding because that was, we knew that was $1.50 an hour. So that was a, <laughs> better a be deal. much better deal. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it taught me the value of hard work and working together. Um, I guess you could say that it was also my first foray into the public, mm. you know, that I had to take people's orders and deliver their meal and, uh, you know, provide some superficial, you know, conversation. And, um, so I learned a lot, but I, I will admit to you that as a kid, I uh, was kind of ashamed of it, oh, you really? know, uh, among my peers. I didn't want people to know where I was on the weekend. I was just, you know, kind of maybe it was class conscious, you know, yeah. I just uh, was a little embarrassed by it. But in retrospect, I know that it gave me so much um, to do that and to do it with my father, you know, to get up on the weekend at four in the morning and go down to the cafe, open it up. The cops would come in, first of all, early in the sure. morning and get then coffee. Um, and get coffee, you know, uh, for 10 cents, an endless amount of coffee, probably really bad coffee, you know, given today's <laughs> standards. Sure. Um, but, you know, I get, you get to meet everybody in the area. And um, so that was interesting. I also saw the evolution of the fast food industry because that's what killed the diner. You know, my, uh, my father uh, could not compete with McDonald's and my father had this sort of old fashioned working man's lunch, you know, that was substantial. Mm -hmm. And they opened up a beauty, uh, a beauty school across the street from the diner and all these young women would come in and want a hamburger and French fries. And it's like, you know, we don't do that. And so my father bought um, a, you know, one of those little broiler things to make, uh, make hamburgers. And we quit making our own French fries. My brother and I peeled a lot of potatoes <laughs> and made a lot of French fries and hash browns. And suddenly it became uh, a demand for fast food. So he got, you know, bags of frozen crinkle fries, which uh -huh. is really gross. I mean, <laughs> compared to the quality French fries that we homemade. made, yeah. homemade, right, right. But, and he really struggled with that, uh, you know, the McDonald's and so forth. And, and round about the time, that's about the time he retired too. And then he actually passed away the year after he retired, which was oh, tough. No. One of the things I was going to ask, it, it, is your mom still around? No, no. My mom died when I was 30. The, you know, this is also something I learned about working people. I mean, they worked themselves to death and they yeah. didn't have benefits. They didn't have health benefits. You know, my father, if he had to, would go to the VA hospital, which was an hour away. And um, he actually became disabled with emphysema, you know, from smoking and from leaning over sure. a hot grill all the time. But it gave me, it really informed my politics yeah. um, about what um, the in inequities in our society. Yeah. Just leave it at that. I really appreciate you sharing that part of your story. Um, and I imagine it would inform your politics and, and especially, you know, as a potential elected official, how, who you'd want to focus on when you're in office. I was, I was kind of thinking what I would, I bet your, I bet your parents would be very proud to see going <laughs> into the political space. Um, because that's a place where you actually can make a difference for a lot of people um, mm -hmm. who have similar experiences. Um, so let's, let's fast forward a little bit. Eventually, you find yourself working in Governor's, Governor Kitzhaber's office. I believe this is, is this first term Kitzhaber or second term Kitzhaber? First, the first eight years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that you were in his office the first eight years. Not quite the full eight. Yeah, I think I left uh, it seven. I think that's increasingly <laughs> uncommon too, people staying for the full eight years of a gubernatorial term. Oh, right. Well, I have to I'll tell you, and I hope Governor Kitzhaber, if you ever watches this, doesn't mind me saying so, <clears throat> but in those first 
two terms, we operated like a family. I mean, everybody mm. knew what was going on. Everybody was included in decision making. It was very democratic. The support staff knew what was going on. Mm. It was a really uh, different form. Um, and, and so I remember uh, the head of DAS at that time telling me that he had never seen a governor's staff like this. And he predicted that no one would leave. Wow. That um, it was a very, you know, close knit group of people. How, how did that happen? Was it just a, a, a culture set from the top down or did you all know each other coming into the office? Uh, no, I mean, um, you know, Governor Kitzhaber brought a couple of people that had worked with him when he was Senate president. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I imagine it's because of the kind of people that he selected, as well as the message that he provided in the very beginning, which was, you know, OK, I'm governor but um, it's the office, it's not me, and it's not you, it's the office. We respect the office of the governor. Mm. And um, it's not because of me that I'm someone mm. special, but this is what we're gonna do, we're gonna do it together and work hard. And I have to say when he interviewed me, I hope he doesn't mind me telling you this, <laughs> um, I was so serious, you know, and when I interviewed with him, like, Governor, you know, I want to take your political capital and I'm going to move the ball down the field in all the areas that we really care about. And he started laughing <laughs> at me. Why? <laughs> he's like, he, he leans over and goes, Olivia, we're also going to have fun. I'm like, fun. Cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah. He's, like, he's, I'll work on that. I'll work on the fun part. <laughs> so so I, 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 I've had to loosen up a little bit, yeah. <laughs> so your your roles in his office was first director of intergovernmental affairs. Yes, yes, yes. And then mm -hmm. legislative director? Yeah, at the very end, right. Yeah, no, I started out with one foot in policy uh -huh. and one foot in his uh, team that determined where he went, who he talked to, and I uh -huh. traveled with him all over the state. I already had a knowledge of the state from my earlier work on affordable housing where I, I traveled all over the state on my own to try to raise, raise awareness about affordable housing needs in rural communities. And so I knew a lot of people all over the state. And what he wanted to do in those days, Ben, was to focus the, uh, the light that followed the governor on the community. So we would hmm. go to a community and uh, show that people were doing good things at the community level, that they were solving problems at the community level, that you know, it, it didn't require government necessarily all the time to solve mm -hmm. those problems. So local people had the capacity to do that. And that's what we would do all over the state. He was also trying to heal the urban rural rift, which exists today. And right. I think you know, Governor Kotek is doing a great job uh, in the same way, getting out, meeting with people in communities all over the state. That's what, I bet you were in the middle of forming this political philosophy. But one thing I've picked up from Governor Kitzhaber is kind of what you, you mentioned is like some of his major accomplishments in his career, CCOs, uh, early learning hubs, um, watershed councils, right. all of these were entities that were were anchored at the local level, anchored exactly. kind of outside of government in some ways. Um, exactly. And I, I'm imagining that's probably a lot of what your job was as the intergovernmental affairs person focusing on local communities. Also working with cities and counties, mm -hmm. because I'd already had that experience working at DEQ and trying to form partnerships and help particularly small communities that were being faced with multiple environmental mandates, mm -hmm. you know, solid waste, wastewater, air quality, they were all being hit with multiple mandates at the same time. And we formulated a way to triage that with, with partnerships. So I took that with me to the governor's office and um, we worked together to form what we call the principles of partnership with local government. Because if, if he was gonna get certain things done, it required the cooperation and coordination with local government. Mm -hmm. Counties in particular, because they're a sister government to state government and cities are like the cousins. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's what we did. And we met with quarterly with representatives of cities and counties all over the state with the governor. And out of that then grew the Oregon Solutions. Uh, uh, I was going to ask you if that was I thought that happened later, but I guess that happened then. 
That started then, we called it Community Solutions, and we brought in the five big agencies, the big five state agencies, and started identifying issues that they needed to work together on to solve in coordination with local government. We should probably, for listeners, explain. Can you explain what Oregon Solutions is and how it actually works? Well, it evolved quite a bit since we started Community Solutions, but it became a really bona fide uh, mm-hmm. state program where you would assemble all the interested parties around a particular issue and work together to resolve that issue, mm. to bring together everyone around a table. And they would have facilitators with certain skills to be able to do that, to get to a solution. And it became a national model. It's a, it's it a le- great way to do business. It leans on the sort of like convening power of a governor, right? If the governor invites people to a table, everyone's going to show up. Um, exactly. And that's sort of the the backbone of the idea, right? It's like, let's get the interested parties together and hash it out together. And that's why uh, in the first term, when we created the community solutions team, in order to cement that, the governor went to the meetings. The oh, governor... Right went to the meetings with the five agencies to keep them focused and at the table. You know, there is a whole, um, uh, what do we call it? Uh, we be here when you be gone, you know, philosophy. <laughs> sure, among. Sure. Uh, I mean, no, no offense on my bureaucratic friends, <laughs> but there is that tendency to, oh, well, he'll be gone or she'll be gone eventually. And we can just go back to our comfort zone. Totally. Well, I mean, I, th- I do think that is, that's something I've, I've heard Governor Kitzhaber talk about, too. It's like solving the biggest problems we face in Oregon today will not be solved in one campaign cycle or one biennium. They need to be sustained across uh, administrations, across legislative turnover. Um, and I don't think we fully figured out how to how to master that. Um, but it's a, it's a tricky challenge. Before we move on from the uh, Kitzhaber administration, I'm wondering if you can share a sampling of like what was going on in Oregon at the time. What were the big issues in the newspapers or that you were focusing on in your role in the governor's office and or I'll make it a little easier. Are there any particular accomplishments um, that you remember from that time that you're proud to have been part of um, <laughs> during the Kitsap well, Red I think that the local government principles of partnership is something that I'm very proud of. But one of the challenges that we had a Republican majority. Mm. And at that point, there was quite an interest in um, rolling back environmental protections, rolling things back. And um, there happened to be a fabulous uh, political cartoon in the Oregonian at that time that showed the governor as the little Dutch boy with his finger in the dike. (laughs) I don't know if you've ever seen that. I haven't. I haven't. (laughs) So, you know, and that at that point, um, he became, you know, like Dr. No with Mm -hmm. an incredible list of vetoes. So that, that was really hard and not the way we, you know, expected to operate. Um, It was very tough. And I think we learned some hard lessons in the beginning about, you know, working with folks early on to try to avoid vetoes but it was a tough time. So you you finish your time in Governor Kitzhaber's administration. He's leaving office. Do you go directly then to TriMet? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So tell tell us why why uh, why <laughs> decide to go to TriMet? Well, I you know I was looking at some of the other big institutions in the Portland area and had other offers, but you know I did that exercise. But what are the five things that you needed a job? And TriMet gave me all five. Hmm. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, embarrassingly, I had friends who said, you're going to go work for the bus company. And I'm like, (laughs) it's "It's more than a bus company. (laughs) It's more than a bus company, right? It's huge. You know, it creates community. It it brings dollars into the region that end up transforming infrastructure. I mean, it was huge. But what was interesting, (laughs) excuse me, at that time, that the uh, director, Fred Hansen, gave me a kamikaze mission. Huh. And the kamikaze mission, Ben, was to raise revenue in a Republican majority. So and, you, were le- you were the, the lobbyist, basically. you the legislative affairs yes, person. Okay. Yes. And uh, we worked on forming a huge coalition in the metropolitan area to garner the support in a Republican legislature to do that. And it was the first time anyone had ever talked about the payroll tax, the TriMet payroll tax, which was established, I think, in 1969. Mm. So it was a tough job. It required every ounce of my attention. 
and didn't get the bill passed until the very last day of the longest legislative session in history. Oh my God. <laughs> and after that, I thought, okay, my work is done. <laughs> and I, I'll, I'll go do something else now. But then we had to implement it, you know, which was not easy either. Right. right. And um, so after that, I never expected to stay at TriMet as long as I did, but I was there for either 11 or 12 years because mm. We then went on to get the seed money for the orange line. Mm. And I was able to get $250 million of the lottery wow. to start to jumpstart and build the Tillicum Bridge. Um, so then Governor Kulangoski in 2009 had a transportation package and we were able to increase the payroll tax once again in that package as something for transit. And there was other pieces for transit around the state as well. But that really secured uh, TriMet's ability to then leverage federal funds for the Green Line and the Orange Line. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to transition to um, contemporary issues. But as my bridge issue, um, Southwest Corridor Project, did you work oh. on it at all? What are your thoughts on it? Is it ever going to oh, happen? So uh, sad. So <laughs> sad. Not, not, a good, not a good start. Uh-oh. <laughs> no, no, no. It, that's okay. Because a tremendous amount of work went into that project you know, just by an incredible staff of people at TriMet, many of which are no longer there, that, you know, mm. they've retired since then. And um, I was brought in uh, as a consultant after I had left TriMet to try to reproduce the miracle, you yeah. know, and to get uh, state support to jumpstart the Southwest Corridor. And uh, that it, times have changed. It just wasn't going to happen. And then there was the Metro ballot measure. And that was just a really sad. And I know every time I would go into uh, Commissioner Dan Saltzman's office, you know, he would ask me, am I, when am I getting my light rail line? When am I getting my line? <laughs> like, wait, soon, <laughs> right? But you know, in, in my, my own humble opinion and hindsight being 2020, uh, I, I wish we had done that earlier. Huh. The Southwest Corridor, there's so much potential there. Yeah. Um, but anyway, can I ask, can I ask, so and this is probably a, a very complicated answer, but what changed? What changed from the time when you were able to mm -hmm. make this happen to today? You've got, you know, the ballot, metro ballot measure goes down. You've got a sense of, I would say, pessimism about ability to generate the local funding necessary for this big project. Like, yes, what what's the what's the gap between I, I would, then and now? Well, one of the big things that changed, Ben, is that, you know, TriMet and, and Oregon and Portland were leaders across the country mm. in um, coming up with, uh, you know, livability, with uh, light rail, with streetcar, with really a very urban, almost European form of transit, very different for our country. Mm -hmm. And because we were early in that pursuit, we were able to get incredible match dollars from the federal government. We would get a 90% match, oh my you know, gosh. and the other complicating factor. So, so we, then we created our own competition all across the country. So when the, when we get to the Southwest quarter, there's a lot more competition for those federal dollars. And it's much less likely that you're ever going to get 90% again, right, right. that you're going to get, if you're lucky, you'll get 60, maybe, you know, maybe 50, maybe even 40. The other complicating factor, Ben, is that Oregon doesn't have a sales tax. Right. So it becomes very difficult to raise the revenue. We, we would have to patch together, you know, 20 million from here and 40 million from here. And the competition for those dollars regionally became more difficult. So just the whole financial picture really changed. Yeah, that's super fair. Um, I hope we can get it figured out at some point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so let me ask you this big broad. Oh, can I, oh, oh sure, yeah, sure, please. go ahead. No, 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 well, I, no, no. I, this is one more thing I wanted to talk about, and that is my work at Providence. Mm. You know, after I retired, or actually on my glide path out of uh, TriMet, I joined the board of the Oregon Providence Health System as a lay person, you know, not being steeped in healthcare, even though I worked for a doctor, I worked for Governor Kitzhaber, I was not uh, steeped in healthcare. But I came in at a time when Providence was changing, and this is all about mm. organizational development, really exciting, but they wanted to go to a statewide board. Providence had a board at every hospital around Oregon, you oh. know, Hood River, Medford, 
seaside um, Newburgh. Every, they all had their own local board that had um, some responsibility for their budget, for making decisions, and they wanted to consolidate that, their governance system. And I became chair at that point. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. But it was terrific because I got to go to meet with all the local boards around the state and listen to them talk about their loss, really their loss of power mm -hmm. um, and control. And that was going to be centralized and what the benefits might be for them. And that was an amazing experience. And so Providence also created a statewide quality board, a statewide credentialing board, which actually ended up with a lot more cross fertilization between the urban and the rural hospitals hmm. and uh, was a great thing to do. But then, um, you know, I left after uh, the big changes started with consolidation of healthcare systems all over the United States. Yeah, it's a, it's a say, different province now. Definitely some some challenges. Um, OK, so let's let's talk about Portland. Um, yes. You've you've worked at all levels of government. You've worked in the region pretty extensively at TriMet. You've seen a transformation happen from, I don't know when Portland's heyday was, uh, but maybe <laughs> 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, to a place where we are today, where, mm -hmm. again, seems to be a sense of pessimism, even defeatism sometimes, um, or maybe even just to your point, desperation, someone fix it, someone make this work again. Mm -hmm. Before we talk about what you would want to do or anything like that, what's your thesis on what happened to Portland? Uh -huh. like what happened oh. to Portland where we got to this place where we are now? Well, um, it's maybe not fair for me to say, but... Mm. Um, it just seems like we didn't, haven't had the kind of leadership that maybe we once had. Yeah. And certainly all the low hanging fruit is gone, you know, and the issues that we deal with are much more complex. Right. And the role of the city has changed as well. I mean, city governments didn't really deal with um, homeless issues to the extent that they are now, that they didn't have the mechanism or the infrastructure. You know, maybe they were a part of a housing authority um, it was really the counties that had the responsibility for social services and, and public safety writ large. Mm -hmm. And now that that's changed. And um, part of it is that Portland's dealing with it. It's in our face, right in our face, in our community. It's much, it's an emergency situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it seems like it's taken us a long time to even declare that it's an emergency. I don't feel that sense of urgency among elected officials. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, thank you for your service and bless your heart. But I just don't feel that we're working together, that the mm -hmm. governments are working together, that there's the kind of intergovernmental coordination or cooperation that we had, for instance, with TriMet, where everybody was on the same team, pulling in the same direction. And it was also, you know, deal making. You get yours, you'll get yours here, mm -hmm. you know that kind of thing went on as well but i just don't see that i see the you know the fighting over the policy issues and that, then it there's the sense that nothing's getting done this um, is the per that is like i'm going to read word for word the question i wrote down because you just gave the perfect introduction to it which is oh. there's a perception that government and especially the overlapping layers of government in the portland area don't work right now uh, and aren't able to solve the biggest problems of the day, like homelessness, housing, and crime. Right. A, do you agree with the perception that I think a lot of people have, which is like government is in the Portland area is not up to solving. And I don't just mean the city of government, the city of Portland government, to be clear. I mean, like Multnomah County's got a role here. Portland's got a role here. Metro's right. got a role here. TriMet's got a role here. The legislature's got a role here. Everybody's got a role here, um, which sometimes mean who's supposed to be in charge of this. Right. But like, do you agree that with the perception like do you find that to be true too and then if so how would you change it or at least how do you improve the perception among voters that we actually can do this well that that's a complex question there are lots yeah. of lots of answers to that um i think that there is reality to that perception yeah that we haven't gotten along now this latest announcement about the three-year extension of the joint office on homelessness I haven't dug in enough to know uh, what uh, the expectations are uh, and how we're going to hold each other accountable for that. Um, but I, I 
I think that's progress mm -hmm. in some way, a small way, potentially. Um, but like I said, I haven't dug into it. I haven't talked to Dan Fields. I don't know exactly uh, what the agreement entails, but it's a good step forward in terms of intergovernmental coordination. But we did, we have had some major disagreements over what do we do first? Mm -hmm. Do we get people off the street and put them in a shelter or do we build permanent affordable housing? Well, that's, they're not mutually exclusive, mm -hmm. but I think we got hung up on that. So, um, for me, it's uh, it's really trying to get the different layers of government, Portland, Multnomah County, the other two counties, Clackamas, mm -hmm. Washington, and Metro, and the state to all work pulling in the same direction immediately, as fast mm -hmm. as we can, mm -hmm. so that we can solve this problem, because it's really undermining people's confidence in government and our democracy. And we can't mm -hmm. afford that right now. That's how I personally feel. We have to show people that it does work, that we can get things done. Um, and, and in some ways, Ben, I think even small improvements work. I mean, I know, you know, I can walk downtown from where I live and the downtown is in district four mm -hmm. and I have seen improvement. I mean, things it's, it's it incrementally, it's getting better but it's not enough. It's not fast enough. It's not fast enough for me. I, mean, I don't want to have to go downtown and look over my shoulder and think, am I safe? Or take my grandson downtown and have to explain to him, why is that guy standing on the street corner, taking his clothes off and screaming? Yeah. You know, uh, that's awful. That's it, right. It's an emergency. And you feel for those people. And I don't want my grandson to think, you know, what, what's this about? Am I living on an alien planet? You know, what, what's going on here? I think those are all solvable. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have a lot of good people in this region that can put their shoulder to the wheel and, and come up with solutions. And um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I appreciate all of that. And the second question I have, and I'm not even sure if this is the right question, um, it's the question of perception and people's confidence in their government, but also I think like confidence in themselves, confidence in um, the soul of the city, the sense of identity, shared purpose. What can we do to um, build a sense of momentum, build a sense of Portland's coming back? Um, mm -hmm. I think it's the Wyden Kennedy billboard that says Portland is what you make it make of it, which I, uh -huh. I, I kind of like, but I'm, I'm curious if you have thoughts. I mean, part of this happens, right? When you solve the problems, people start to build confidence, right? So part yeah. of it is like, do the right work. But I think there is a separate side that's about like inspiring people and giving people a sense of progress. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Like perception well, side? I do. I think, I think right off the bat, several things have to happen. And maybe this new form of government will help in this mm -hmm. way in that will people will be rooted in their district. Mm -hmm. that they will be talking to more people. Hopefully more people will be aware of what's going on, the efforts that are being made. I'm a strong supporter of neighborhood associations. Mm -hmm. When I worked in Salem, I worked with neighborhood associations. The city used to fund them, make sure that they had newsletters, make sure there was a two-way exchange. So I think that's part of the solution is getting more people aware of and involved in what's going on. Um, I think what I said earlier, the intergovernmental coordination has to happen in day one after the election. Those 12 people have got to put their heads together. You know, first of all, you know, meet each other and figure out what their principles of partnership are going to be and how they're going to work together. But they've kind of got to come up immediately with some kind of a strategic plan, some kind of a plan that represents where they want to go, what their values are, and how we're going to get there. And that document also is going to what's help help uh, hold the city manager and the deputy city managers accountable for results. Mm. There ha that that has to happen. We have to cement something there, and we're going to make it up as we go along because you know this hasn't been done before. But sure. those those are my thoughts. Is that you know we we need to have that council create something that they can take out to the community and hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. I think that will inspire, hopefully inspire some confidence, but it's not until we also take some other small steps like graffiti removal, that's right. trash removal. I mean, that's the visible stuff. Maybe some more public restrooms. Um, 
I, I hear a lot a... about those three, those three right there. Trash. Oh, you're graffiti kidding. And I'm not no, original. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, I think actually, um, um, uh, I think it was Eric Zimmerman who brought it up too, but I think it, it actually, those to me strike me as like, those are, th I don't want to say they're easy because they're not, it's not easy to stay in front of trash collection. But if you can do those things, you can prove to people that government can work, that we can right. solve these problems and they'll start to experience a day-to-day -day difference in their lives. Like, I think, I think you're onto something there. Um, can I say one other thing about yeah, yeah. that? Please. Is that in my, uh, I live in a condo and uh, the building next door had a, a kind of a pseudo break-in the other day. Mm. And I think it was a homeless person that, saw an easy target and um, started a fire on somebody's oh patio and broke open their uh, storage shed and pulled stuff out and that kind of thing. And the gal that uh, was staying there, it's her parents' place, called the police and um, the police came. And that was great. Yeah. And, and that it was like, oh, response. And then the fire department came. And the fire department put out the fire and that made everybody feel good. You know, yeah. that restored, they didn't have to wait 45 minutes. I mean, that's also on my website is I don't want to wait 45 minutes for a 911. That's right. You know, and the 911 doesn't necessarily mean we need a police officer, you know, that we need to work on that. Yeah. Um, but it, it restored some sense of confidence among the people around here that, oh, the police responded. The guy, they had to let him out. It was a misdemeanor. He came back the next morning and did exactly the same thing. And the police came and took him away again. Um, oh, that's so yeah. hard. Uh, but, <laughs> but but it does show like, do, do the basics. You know, yeah. 911 call without a wait time, police response quickly. You know, that mm. again, I think you're right. It, it is it's really important to people. Um, Okay, so we've got a couple minutes left here. We're coming close on time. But my last like kind of broad question is mm. geared towards two things. One is the change of government and two is the pressing challenges. And you sort of alluded to this. So you let's say you get elected and you've got 11 colleagues and they are going to almost certainly represent a very wide swath of the political spectrum, um, I would imagine. I would imagine you're going to have people who are very far left. Um, and you're going to have some people, maybe not very far right. That probably isn't going to happen, but you're going to have people. <laughs> it's Portland. Who, yeah. You're going to have people who are probably like right of center ish. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of people who are wondering, you know, that you could make that be something really beautiful where you get everyone aligned, um, regardless of what they believe politically on some sort of strategic plan. Uh, but there also seems to be a potential for um, some level of dysfunction um, and some level of, you know, political uh grandstanding or whatever tell us like what your theory of action will be if you get elected and you've got 11 colleagues how are you going to approach this new job what are you going to do starting the day that you get elected to try to make sure that um you know drawing from your previous experience with like Oregon solutions and and working with local government how do we make sure that this goes well and that the government's being responsive to the issues that are um on people's minds well right off the bat I think that we need to get to what are our values? What do you want, Ben? Mm. What do you want for your district? What can what is uh, in the city's wheelhouse to do? What are the levers? What can we do? It's not, you know, there's a lot of issues floating around. Some are much bigger. Uh, there's a performative political stuff. But really, what does the city do? Mm -hmm. And what are your values? What do you want out of the city? Police, fire, 911, making sure that our water system's resilient and going to work during uh, climate change, that our sewer system's going to work during climate change, that our roads are functioning, our drainage system, all of those basic things, are they gonna work? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the stuff of local government, really. And then there's the next layer, the homeless issue, the, the drug crisis on the streets. Where, where are we on that? And trying to get at each individual person's values. Now that's mm -hmm. gonna probably take some facilitation. I don't know that uh, all those skills will be available on the new council right. to do that themselves. But um, that's, and that's, I think that's an Oregon tradition 
-hmm. old style is we have a lot more in common east and west urban rural republican democrat than we realize so how do we get at those fundamental values where we can work together Mm. and okay so you ben you want something different than i want west side east side whatever it is how do we support each other Mm. how do i help you get what you need in district one or two or three and what i need over here in district four and need for the downtown and actually everybody owns the downtown you know this is portland's living room right Mm -hmm. this is where people come where we generate a lot of revenue for our region it's very important to everyone but anyway essentially i think getting at people's values and what does the city actually do mechanically i like that a lot Well, Olivia, you've been very generous with your time. Um, Before I let you go, if people want to learn more about you or they want to support your campaign, um, where would you direct them? My website is oliviaforportland.com. And I am a part of the uh, small donor program. Mm. Um, So anybody who wants to help me out to get the, the initial 250 would be greatly appreciated. But thank you for your time, Ben. It's really been fun to talk to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Olivia. Really appreciate talking to you. All right. Talk to you.